Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, it's Thursday, November 9th, I believe. Hey? So uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we invite your spirit's presence here into the study. And we just ask for your Holy Spirit uh, to speak to us, to teach us, uh, to comfort us, to reveal to us our need of you and your mercy and love and the work that you want to accomplish in us. Uh, we are thankful for the gifts of salvation, for the light that has come on on our path for our feet. And we just pray, Lord, that we can be strengthened in the inner man. Be with us now in this study. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Now, as I've complained a few times, this study is really difficult for me. Um, but I do believe that by going over these things again and again, we are coming to understand the, the application of Daniel chapter 11, not just in its historical setting, uh, but also in the application for the present. And one of the things that we, we did when we first looked at Daniel 11 in this series of studies, and we started looking at the Hebrew numbers, we use those to, um, sometimes to guide us in what we were seeing and sometimes to affirm what we were seeing um, in, in our present truth application. So we talked a little bit about it yesterday, the end of years. And um, so when I was looking at the end of years, I, I connected this to Stephen's birthday. That is um, this number, uh, 7,093, which is translated as end, um, we used a iteration of that, 7309, to go from Stephen's birthday when he was born in February 11th, 69, to February 15th, 1989. Um, now, I did think that there was some other place that we used that number itself. Uh, well, yes, and that's where it was from. Uh, November 9th or, or September 11th, 2001 to uh, February 11th, 2021. So we can take um, Stephen's birthday and uh, we know that it connects from when he is born to September 11th um, is this period of 11,900 days, right? So so Stephen's birthday becomes this this key, but it's this this end of years, and so it ties us to 9/11 and to the end of this war, right? That uh, uh, Soviet-Afghan war. So, and then we have the years. That number um, eight one four one. That number shows up in the span from September 11th to December 25th. 2023. Now that begins that verse. Now we know that verse symbolizes 9-11 because if you just put it end on end, you see you would get 9-11, right? If you flip 11-6 over, it's going to be 9-11. And then we have the last word in this verse, times. Now 6256, if you multiply 6 times 2, you're going to get uh, 12 right, times six is, um, that's 12 times six is what, 72. I'm trying to remember how we did that. Um, for some reason here, just hang on. So we six times two times five times, which is 60 times six, which is 360. Okay, so that's the number. So we get this number 360. And so 360 relates to prophetic time, to the symbol of prophetic time. Now, um, now that period of time, so if we take 6256 and we divide it by 
um, 360, right? So we're, we're going to take that prophetic year, 360. You're going to get uh, uh, 17 years in prophetic time and 136 days. And um, But if we did it as, so 6256 divided by 365.25, it's going to be 17 years. It'll be less, obviously. Yeah, so reminds us of the circle of the repeat of history. Yeah. If we take 360. And then it also just ends up being um, uh, 47, uh, 17 years and 47 point or 46.75 days. Now, one of the things is if you go from November 9th and you count 6,265 days, you're going to get uh, December 25th, right? So one of the things that we've seen in this is we have this December 25th date show up, right? It becomes part of this line. Um, so, so we have these times. He's going to strengthen her in these times. Now, who is it that strengthened her in these times? We say, well, this is going to be the U.S. is going to be strengthening her in these times. And her was wokeism, right? So if we go back to our paper that we're working on. So if we go back here. And go back to this where we were working at. Um, so we, we're trying to sort this out. The one whom he begat or whom she begat, which her son equals Biden is what we put there. And he that strengthened her in these times. Now the her, of course, is wokeism. Now, it's true that the USA strengthened her in these times, right? But these times are specifically then defined by this Hebrew number, right? Now, it's a period of time from November 6th, or November 9th, pardon me, to December 25th. Now, we know that it's a period of 17 years and 47 days, and that doesn't fit into our lines. We don't have a November 9th and a De De December 25th that fits that, but we do have a November 9th and a De December 25th that um, does fit into our lines. So even though that number is many more years than our period of 777 days. It still can represent that period of 777 days. So, so I'm just going to put this in here, uh, this word. Um, so I'm not sure why I have this here, so I'm going to move this over. So this this actually should really go here. He that strengthened her. Oops, I don't want to do it that way. And then when it comes to these times, we're going to see that this is the Hebrew 6256, which equals, uh, let's say, 17 years. and 46 days, and also November 9th to December 25th. So this, so if we look at what was happening in that period of time, November 9th to December 25th, How would we how would we how would we look at the application of what is strengthening her? How was wokeism strengthened in that period of time?
Does that make sense to people? It's in red, just so let's see. Any thoughts on that? Okay, so Angela mentions 17 years and 46 days. Isn't this related to Capricar's constant? And we would have to say, yeah. Okay. Okay, so Oran says that strengthened her in these times, the sum is 365. So um, that is the gematria of that phrase that strengthened her in these times. So if we take this here, um, uh, so, uh, um, so I guess how do we put this here? So this word times, I'll put this like this, times equals, and then this phrase strengthened her in these times. Um, so the gematria being 365, I think, is rather interesting. So I don't know how we put that in here. I'm just going to go leave it like this for now. Um, I might add something there later. Uh, let me see. Just a lot of things to put in a footnote. Maybe I'll just put it as a footnote. I can put a footnote at the end of the sentence. Okay. So we have a representation there of not just a, a prophetic year with the word times, but also with that phrase that strengthened her in these times being 365. Okay. So we also have um, Capricar's constant as well. So we should be able to see that in those numbers. Normally it's what, 1764. It just, we put it into, in order, but any iteration of those four digits. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to add that numerical uh, information to what we were looking at. And, and I'm going to put more footnotes in there and add more things as I go through this on my own. So then we went through this paragraph um, of section verses seven to nine. And, and so this starts to make a lot more sense out of the branch of her Bernice's Volkism's roots. Uh, that is from the family, from her family. So. The UN, the globalist, Joan Ptolemy the Third, you your your GTs, your your GTs, I guess is how you pronounce it. Probably wrong, but Biden, we put Biden there, stand up in his estate. So we use that word estate, uh, the um, 
to connect us to, um, and that's going to be a period of 10 years. It's 3653 is the number. So, you know, these things I probably should put in here. Um, maybe I could do these as footnotes. Um, from 1, 20, 11, to 1, 20, 20. I'll do it that one. Uh, so it assumes the throne of Egypt, which is globalist America. Now, we put there globalist America because... This is the throne of Egypt. So Egypt is the world, the United States, globalist America. Um, not just America, but globalist America, which shall, with an army, launch an invasion, a propaganda campaign, and shall enter into the fortress, which is the U.S. Constitution of the King of the North, which is Seleucid Syria, right, the United States, and shall deal against them, attempt to exact revenge for his sister's death, in the historic application in ours, it's the lawfare against Trump that occurred. All of those uh, impeachments and everything else that was happening. And shall prevail, win the third Syrian war, the 2020 election. And shall also carry captives into Egypt. Their gods recover pagan idols captured from Egypt by the Persians in the former conquests. In the historic, in ours is this pantheism, paganism, transgenderism. That we see with their princes, that is, take captives of Egypt, the princes being the celebrities, um, are captivated, right? And with their precious vessels of silver and gold, spoils of war, Hollywood, multinationals, uh, tech industries, um, have some multinationals. And he, Ptolemy, that is the third Biden, shall continue more years. Uh, now, in the historic, it says he died in, in 221. Then the king of the north, Seleucus, died in 226. So no 221 comes after 226. Um, so continue more years. Well, we don't know particularly what that means in regard to Biden. I would say I can't imagine Biden continuing to be the president of the United States. Um, other than that, we can say that to some degree, uh, you know, he, he exists past uh, Trump, right? So Trump is, is removed. Now, a lot of this um, here, so the king of the South, Ptolemy III Biden, shall come into his, his Seleucus's USA government's kingdom, right? Uh, that is the land of the USA, and shall return into his own land, Egypt, the UN. So we don't know what that means, particularly uh, in this application. We're not certain yet. We just put some stuff down there uh, to see what this means. Now, now if Ptolemy III is actually Biden, which it seems to be from the symbols that we have here, that it symbols, he, he symbolizes his work, symbolizes what happened in this history, uh, with Biden, um, how would we understand this? And so I know jumping back into this is, is a little bit tough. But Stephen, you haven't been at some of the, the, the studies here. Do you have any thoughts on what we're doing? Uh, criticisms, corrections, uh, questions? Um, I think kind of like my favorite. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't really have anything. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, you can see how this study, though, is what we've gone through, that there is a logic to it in, in making this present truth application. And, you know, going back to Chowatu's, where he's going to place this in, in 
you know, the time of the end, 1798, all this is going to be uh, that history going into our history. So you, he's going to be taking Daniel 11, verse 40, A and B, and having them represented because that's the king of the south coming against the king of the north, king of the north coming against the king of the south. Um, what we're doing in our application is we're placing it all in our history. Right? So the, these battles between the king of the north and the king of the south are all typifying what's happening now in, in this history of this movement since 1989. So our history starts with the battle of the king of the north conquering the king of the south. It doesn't start with the king of the south conquering the king of the north, as we see in Daniel 11, verse 40a. But yet we take that, uh, that history is, is all repeating these battles that are happening at the time of the end. So in our history. So I don't know if that's confusing to people. Right, or whether people understand it enough to be confused by it. Right, so that's one of the things that we have to address. So this last part that we dealt with, um, with Biden, that he continues more, um, you know, he continues more years than the king of the north. I'm not sure what that really means. Here in the original, it has to do with when the person died. Um, but we're not going to take that. Literally, I don't think is saying, you know, that uh, Biden's going to live longer than Trump. Uh, I don't think that that's what it's talking about. It's just as far as these uh, this influence. Now, Trump is, of course, back in in the scene, on the scene again, right, in this, this further battle. And it's still undetermined whether Trump will get elected again or something will happen. We're saying that things, no matter who becomes president, that things are going to devolve into a civil war in the United States that's going to be, you know, we'll say, a bloody civil war, right? So right now we have a propaganda civil war. Um, but things are going to get more tense, and uh, America is becoming more divided rather than less divided. So saying that Ptolemy the third shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land. So he's going to go back to the UN. I'm not sure what that would mean symbolically. So, so he returns into his own land, Egypt, right? But we're saying, well, Egypt represents the UN, but we also have um, uh, the throne of Egypt is globalist America, right? And he stands up in his estate. So, so returning into his own land, Egypt, when we say it's the UN, is there any other way that we can look at this in a more broad sense? or maybe in a more specific sense, what it would mean that Biden comes into his kingdom and shall return to his own land, Egypt, which is what? Any thoughts on that, anyone? Because I'm not sure what this would mean. Can we agree that this is not a literal passage? This has to be a a figurative passage. Yeah, well, we're using these all as figures, right? So, yes. Okay. So any any thoughts then? Well, <clears throat> a 
what if the returning into his own land? I mean, I, I understand the point about this being equating Egypt to the UN, but what if this is more spiritualism? Is that possible? Okay. So Egypt representing uh, spiritualism. Well, the UN represents spiritualism. Okay. I mean, we recognize that at the end of time, that three that the United States is going to reach its hand quote across the Gulf to be joined with Rome and with spiritualism. Okay. So so here we can say that that Biden has has joined with spiritualism. Right. Okay. Okay, makes sense. Um, well, when he stands up in his estate, he assumes the throne of Egypt. When we say that's globalist America, so we have Egypt there, right? It's the throne of Egypt. Um, so now we're going to have, you know, he he comes into his kingdom. I mean, this is, this would then be uh, the election, right? Winning the election. So so we're going to say that he comes into his kingdom, U.S. government. That's obviously going to be. Either the election or the inauguration. I would probably put the inauguration. Uh, um, so we're just going to say that's going to be January 20th, 2021. Maybe that's what we could say there. And shall return into his own land, Egypt. So what is this returning into his own land then? We're saying he's he's connecting with spiritualism, but how is that happening at that time? I mean, he's already connected with the globalists. But this has to do with the mandates, maybe even something like that. You know, or oops. Would we connect it in that way? I'd have to think about that. Because it, it just seems to me it has to be something that connects him. So not just begetting the kingdom, but his actions. And we say he returns to his own land. Well, you know, I'm not really sure, but I'm just going to put that there for now. Right. So that's going to connect to that period of time. Um, when he, he becomes the president. So he's going to, uh, now, now technically, um, like we had some discussion about it. Um, so the COVID-19 vaccine, the mRNA, mRNA vaccine, um, let me see here. So those ended up happening in 2020, 
right? So basically, I still, the timeline of that, that's what I want. Um, um, I don't want the timeline of the pandemic. Anyway, we're going to see that, uh, because uh, it's in 2020 that the vaccine is administered, right? I believe that to be correct. So I think. So it's going to be so December of 2020. I'm just trying to figure out how. So so we know that that uh, it's going to be after Biden wins the election, but there's always this transition between governments, right? Um. So how does that happen when the vaccine's administered? I mean, is it technically under Trump's government that it's administered? How does that happen? There was vaccine that was being administered while Trump was yet president, yes. So that's under his government, because the government doesn't change hands until January uh, 20th. Correct. Okay. Okay. Now, we're not going to, do we have mandates under Trump? No, right? I thought there were. Okay. Um, let me see here. No. So those are going to be um, – so the first mandates, okay. So so obviously you have things dealing with um, uh, the, the pandemic itself. Um, Yeah, so in December of 2020, Biden said he did not intend to mandate that all citizens receive a COVID-19 vaccine. Right. So it's going to happen in 2021 that you're going to get the mandates. So they first started with, uh, in, well, so the federal mandates are going to be September 20, September 2021. Um, and so they're going to continue. Uh, yeah, so that's going to be. Okay. Yeah, so they're going to be connected to through that period of Biden's for that those mandates are going to occur. Okay. So yeah, so there's no mandates under Trump. There's the vaccine is put out under Trump's administration, but the mandates are going to come under Biden's administration. Now, so both Trump and Biden, of course, are affected by the UN and the World Health Organization, et cetera. Um, So I don't know. Anyway, it's just just us thinking about this, trying to figure out what this means. Um, <clears throat> so if we go on, it says, but his, Seleucus' sons, Seleucus the third, Serenus, 
Serenus, Serenus, Soter, and Antiochus the third Magnus shall be stirred up, desire to war against Egypt, and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, raise a large army, and one, that is one son, Antiochus the third, shall certainly come and overflow and pass through, start the fourth Syrian war. Then shall he, Antiochus the third, return, fight against Egypt, be stirred up, even to his fortress. Now, so this overflowing and pass, passing through, this is the king of the north. He's going to overflow and pass through. We have these several wars, right? The third, fourth, and then you know, eventually the fifth Syrian war. Um, so this seems the response to wokeism, which is here shown in symbols as the Sunday law, right? That's what we see these overflowing and pass through. That's the Sunday law. Now, this is one of Seleucus' sons, right? So Seleucus, um, this is Seleucus the second, right? So he's going to have Seleucus the third and Antiochus the third. So how do we understand this history? So I'm going to just go over here. So this is um, you can see here this is the history we're speaking of right here. So you got Ptolemy the third. He's uh, in 246, so you're saying this is Biden, right? And it's in the time of Seleucus Callinicus, right? They're both in the same period of time, right? And then we have uh, Seleucus the third, Serianus, and Antiochus the third. Now notice that these two. Uh, kings of the north are very close to each other, right? So they're so they're sons of Seleucus II, right? That's the idea here. So if we look at and so Antiochus the third so dies on the 3rd of July in 187 BC, so he's going to be replaced by Seleucus IV. Um, Did you take a look at the meaning of Callinicus? No. What does it mean? From the Greek, it means beautifully triumphant. Okay. The other thing is Seleucus Telinicus was proclaimed king by his mother. Okay. So what does that mean then? Well, He was proclaimed king by his mother while the father's second wife, Berenice, declared her son Antiochus king in Antioch. Okay. So how do we relate this to our history? 
Well, we are we are placing Kalinicus as Trump, right? Well, sort of. Yeah, they're they're. We, yeah, we're we're sort of doing that. I mean, not not directly, because uh, we we the only one that we've really directly said that this is a president is Ptolemy the third, right? So we haven't really put Trump as any of those um, kings of the north. In particular, it just refers to. Uh, the United States, right, to the King of the North America. But then it's going to be taken over by Ptolemy the Third, right? He's going to come and um, his rise is representing taking over the throne of of the world. So I don't, you know, he comes to the fortress of the King of the North. So I, I don't know. I'm not sure how we we understand this because. I mean, I have trouble putting Biden as Ptolemy, Ptolemy the third, you know, to take Biden and just place him in there. But it seems to fit. But I don't think we can do that with Trump. But what what I was looking up is that Antiochus the third and Seleucus the third, they're both sons of Callinicus, right? So that was the main thing I was trying to look at. So what what is what what are your thoughts then? Well, I'm just, I'm having to look at this from a world history standpoint because yeah. it was partisans of Seleucus, Callinicus, and Laodice that murdered Berenike. Yeah. And this occurred before uh, Ptolemy the Third was able to land to support her son's claims. Okay. So, does this have a relation to January sixth? Well, yeah, I think January sixth should be in here somewhere, but I'm not sure exactly. Where? So, so what we see here, though, is, is in in the verse nine, we we have Biden taking; he's winning the election, right? He's going to win this election after this propaganda campaign and um, this attack on the American Constitution. Right. So we're going to have all of this stuff that's happening with um, that in this period of time. Right. So in right. that period of time, we're going to have, you know, the BLM riots. You're going to have, um, uh, you know, lots of different sort of things going on with uh, trials of different people. Right. So there's all this propaganda going on, trying to make. The Republicans appear to be like right wing extremists of some sort. Um, it's just creating more and more division in the United States during that period. Um, lots of hatred going on on both sides. Um, now Trump ends up losing in that election. Lots of reasons why. He's very popular with some, but extremely unpopular with others. And uh, there's just so much that went on to cause Trump to lose that election. So we can see that there's definitely this lawfare, this um, propaganda campaign going against Trump, who is the one who has, um, you know, because we have wokeism that has come in. And so Seleucid Syria is the king of the north here. We're just going to say it's the USA, right? We're not saying it's it's Trump is the king of the north. Um, but with the death of um, Berenice, and, and then we have to understand, well, how is, how is wokeism died? 
well, it's more an attack on it that that has happened by Trump. That that we have this back this initial backlash against Trump, right? So that actually helps promote this this wokeism in this history. But it's going to be uh, Biden who becomes the president. Now, first he's going to, of course, become. You know, there's this whole process in which he becomes uh, the Democratic leader, right? Running for re-election, re- and then finally he wins this election. So, um, so when we get to verse ten, but his. That is, Seleucus would refer to the kings of the north's sons, right? If we're going to, now they're also kings of the north. So Seleucus represents the USA, but he must represent the USA in in a particular way, right? He can't, because obviously Biden's in the American government, right? So if we say, you know, uh, Republican USA, Republicans. I don't know. So that's where I have the problem when I try to get this direct one-to-one correlation between each of these symbols. You know, can we say that Seleucus or is his here, his sons representing something else? Well, the his is the USA, right? So is this Protestant America? And then, well, who is it that stirred up? You know, who does Seleucus III and Antiochus III represent? They're stirred up. They desire to war against Egypt. And it mentions two of them, right? Now they're going to be one after the other. And and so when it says they shall assemble a multitude of great forces, raise, raise a large army, well, if we look at the previous one, that was a propaganda campaign. Maybe there's something here that has to do with propaganda in the other way. And then it says one son, that is Antiochus III, shall certainly come, overflow, and pass through. Symbols of the Sunday law. Then shall he, Antiochus III, return, that is, fight against Egypt, and be stirred up even to his fortress. So so the king of the north coming to the fortress of the king of the south, right? And the way that this was understood even to his fortress, uh, we applied, we went back to um, uh, what happened with the fall of the Soviet Union. That's the way that Jeff looked at it, right? So this was the fall of the Soviet Union. And um, so... The way that Chawatu, I would understand, is he would take all of this as referring to history of Daniel 11, verse 40a, and this would be Daniel 11, verse 40b, right? That's how he's going to look at it, as the response. But, But the symbols here are the response of the Sunday law. So, so we, ha- so we have options on how we look at this. I would think that we just continue looking at this as going from 2021 up to the Sunday law. So this would be the response to wokeism where, uh, they come up even to the fortress. Right. So that there is an attack. Now, obviously, they don't destroy spiritualism. Then what we get next is under Ptolemy the fourth, we're going to have Raphia. And then we're going to have Paneum. So so what we would have to try to understand from this is this. I mean, this if if Raphia and Paneum are are. The next ones. Well, this, this is, can only be a type of the Sunday law. It can't be the Sunday law itself. So that's where I'm having a problem trying to place this. I don't know where to place this history. 
Because normally you would just say, well, this is the USA. But his sons, what are they? Right? Are these presidents? Or what? What are they? Right? So, so we just don't know what they represent yet. At least I don't know. And, and so this would then be a uh, desire to war against Egypt, I would take as a propaganda, propaganda, propaganda campaign again. Right? That would make the most sense if we're going to be consistent on how we're symbolizing uh, or taking these symbols, how we're understanding them in our time. So, so he desires to war against Egypt, and then we have this large army. And so we don't know what this army is. Now, maybe this is a type of civil war. Is that what this is referring to? Now, now we could say, well, how come we're not, how come we're using it literally here? Right, but I'm just, I'm just putting it there. So, because we have this propaganda campaign and then it devolves into the civil war of some sort. Right, so that, that would be what happens. And so this one son, Antiochus III, is this a president? Okay. So Angela says, um, I don't know what GBE is. And that, unless it's a typo. It probably means would be generals, military leaders really during martial law. Since Ptolemy means aggressive and warlike, I would suspect these end time Ptolemies would, would be generals, military leaders ruling during martial law. Possibly. You know, so one of the things to consider about this, I mean, we know that this is, this is Greece and Greece is in a civil war already. Right. I mean, that's what the North and the South is about. This is a civil war for the control of Greece. Now, we can say they're two different empires, but it's it's a division of Alexander's kingdom. So. Um, now, when we were dealing with this yesterday, we we're studying this. What is it that. That we noticed, at least I noticed that I'd never noticed before uh, in, in considering uh, this history. What did, what did we, what did we, what insight did we have? Anybody remember? Anybody? Because I don't remember what the insight was. It's something that struck me, but I don't remember what it was. I'm not recalling it either. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I don't remember what it was, but there's some something that we had noticed, um, and, and I know it's important in the, what we're talking about now, but it, it'll come back to me. It's just on the edge of my mind. Um, 
So we have this civil war, right? So this is a civil war, the North and the South. And we've looked at this comparison between what's happening in the United States as a civil war. I mean, definitely we could uh, look at the civil war that happens in Miller, or not Miller, uh, um, in Israelite history, right? So you have, of course, the civil war that creates the two kingdoms, North and South, and you have uh, that civil war in 742 B.C., Right. So we have these civil wars and we can look at the civil war in the United States. Right. We can see that the north, it's the north and the south. We have these north and south civil wars, but east and west civil wars, they're north and south. So here we have a civil war going on. And and they're battling for control of the U.S., which is the in this case, it's the king of the north. So you have. A civil war within a civil war, so to speak. Um, so if we have this one son, Antiochus the third, I mean, again, is this, you know, we, we say here, is he the president, right? It's the one son. So again, you just Is this a president of the United States that uh, that is now being symbolized here? And then he's going to certainly come overflow and pass through, start the fourth Syrian war. So here, the fourth Syrian war, is this just the civil war, right? So, I mean, this is the preparation for civil war here, uh, um, assembling a multitude of great forces. Again, is this just the civil war? That's is that what's describing how that civil war comes. Now, it's in the language of the Sunday law, overflowing and passed through. So is this talking about a Sunday law in the United States in actuality? Or is it talking about a type of the Sunday law? Well, we already have had a type of the Sunday law. The pandemic. So we're going to see him fighting against Egypt and stirred up even to his Ptolemy the fourth Philopater's fortress, right? So we know Ptolemy the third is going to die, and then we have Ptolemy the fourth. So what is that? as far as trying to understand this in the context of, um, so if we go here, so you're going to see you got Antiochus III, and then two years later, Ptolemy IV is the king of Egypt. So, I mean, do we need to, to say that this is a particular person And this is the king of the south. So how are we going to resolve these, these problems? So every time we look at these things, I say, well, you know, we've got a lot of things fitting. But the more the more we spend time in understanding this, we do get a lot of things to fit. But we also get a lot of questions. Um, so this, this uh, verse 10 must be things that are, if we're going to follow that this is Raphi and Paneum, that these must be things that precede Raphia, right? So what we're going to have with Raphia is the king of the south, Ptolemy IV, shall be moved with collar, raise an army, shall come forth and fight with him, continue the fourth Syrian, even with the king of the north, Antiochus III. So we're going to see that this is a precursor to the Battle of Raphia. And we say the Battle of Raphia represents on our, on the line that Jeff has, 9-11, Midnight, Midnight Christ, Sunday Law, Raphia is midnight, and that we haven't arrived at that midnight yet. But we do have these precursors to that. Now we say, well, the Sunday Law is obviously after midnight and midnight cry. So we have this type of a Sunday Law, How, how do we look at that? 
how are we going to continue going through this paper and placing these these events, especially things that haven't happened yet? It's easy once things have happened to sort of place them. We can see that's what's happened. That's what parallels what happened. Now, we could take the Battle of Rafi and the Battle of Paneum and say, well, we're going to make an application of them, but not to the bigger line that Jeff has, but just back to our history as a repeat and enlarge. Right? That's, that's, we've done that with, with other lines when we went through judges. Each of these repeated and enlarged uh, our history. And the question is, can we see further than our history that we've passed through? Or can we take this history, what we've learned from what we've done earlier, to sort of say, here is how things are going to unfold. Any thoughts on that? I know it's, it's a difficult thing to think about on how we're going to proceed with this. Because we don't even know if our whole premise of how we're applying these things are correct. Right? Now, one of the things that we saw with Daniel 1111 was, and I want to go back to this. So when we look at Daniel 1111, I was dealing with the Hebrew numbers. So like we did with other verses. So we know Daniel 1111 is this symbol. It's a symbol that goes back with the 22 generations from creation to the entry into the land of Egypt, which is divided as 1111, 11 to the flood, 11 afterwards. It's the 22 years in the story of Joseph. 11 from his vision or his dreams when he's then sold into Egypt to the dreams of the butler and baker, and another 11 years until his dreams are fulfilled, making 22 years, the symbol of restoration. Right. So we have this 11 and 11 showing up many places. We had it show up in uh, the book of Judges. So now we have it here, Daniel 11, 11, and it's this important chiastic structure, right? It's the Battle of Raphia. Battle of Raphia is symbolized 217 BC, June 22nd. If we take in the 70 weeks prophecy and we cut the 62 weeks in half, um, you're going to have 434 years divided in half is 217 years, right? And that's going to represent that battle of Raphi in, in 217 BC. So, so we have this structure and this has to do with our history. Right now, this verse itself, when I added up all the Hebrew numbers, I came to a number that uh, I mistakenly identified. That is, I took the verse and my program, and I'll just show you here. So when I put it into Excel and I tried to total up all the verses. I, I didn't have it like this. I just had all of this, and I went like this. And it would give me this number, 67,340. Now, this is 187 years and 20 days, if we take it as prophetic years. And now, the problem was, is that the program, when I totaled, when I made this total at the bottom, it actually didn't include the last number. And I'm not sure why. I still don't know why that happened. But that last number is a symbol of the message to the Levites. It's March 27th. Right? So what we have is we have a verse, Daniel 11, 11, that if we take the first 14 Hebrew words, it's going to give us this symbol of July 18, 2020. And then it's going to have the number of the Levites added to it. No, it's, it's it's not 273, but it's 3027, but it's still symbolizing that because March 27th 
would be represented there, right? Which is a symbol of 273. So we got this message to the Levites tied to the symbol with July 18, 2020. We know if you go from July 18 to 2020, and you count 252 days, you get to March 27th, and then it's 273 days to December 25th, 2021. So we have that symbol there. So, so Daniel 1111, Raphia, relates to our history, and we do make an application of Raphia to our history. So we could just argue that we're not going to use these verses, even though these verses will apply to events that are still future. We would just use these verses to reflect our history, what we've passed through, not what's coming prophetically. Now, we know what we're passing through is typical of what's going to happen. But we can't make a direct application in the way that we were trying to do it here with the past to what's going to happen in the future. It can only bring us light for our feet. And then we know that our experience that we're going through becomes meaningful. Now, the problem here is this becomes fairly esoteric. It becomes something that's just like a hidden knowledge that only we understand. I don't particularly like things like that. Um, but it's something that we need to understand. We need to understand our history, where we are at, and what it is we're struggling with. Because we have lots of voices clamoring for our attention. And this movement has, you know, basically shut us out. They, they don't want to have anything to do with what we're saying. You know, so even though Colin, you know, challenged me and said, you know, I want you to do Daniel chapter 11. Um, you know, he's not really interested in what I have to say as far as receiving light. He's only interested in what I have to say as something that he can then attack. Now, I could be wrong in that, but that's how it appears. Because he took a study that I did, did a video on it, and all he did was attack the video and incorrectly right so and then just cut off all communication so so we know that there's something going on and so we need to have light for our feet and if and if god has given us light in how we understood uh, the book of judges and how we understand the lines then there should be light here for us but I'm not comfortable with trying to predict the future. I'm not comfortable saying, well, we now can take this and we can say what's going to happen in the coming election and when the Sunday law is going to come and how this is all going to unfold. I don't think God can give us light there yet. Maybe as we go through those events, we can start to receive light in that way. So would it be fair to say, we're going to go back, we're just going to say that Daniel 10 verse 11 represents the coming Sunday law, the details of which we don't fully understand. And that Daniel 11, 11 is going to represent events that have happened in our history. At least that's how we can apply them. We can we can take them back, place them back at what what has happened, not what's going to happen. Any thoughts on that? I know it's a long sort of rambling uh, statement, but we do see the problem that we're in, right? As a movement.
Any more thoughts? Are we just, because we need to figure out what, what it is we want to do with this. I mean, because we have an option. We could continue going through this. Because, I mean, I would like to. But I don't know if I know enough to understand how to do it. So we're going to need some kind of guidance on, on what we want to do with this. Now, think about this here. Um, so let's look at this um, this document that we're working on. Okay, let's look at verse 10. Then shall he, Antiochus III, return, fight against Egypt. Now, we're going to say Egypt. Uh, we look at Egypt as the UN. Right? So, so the U, so the United States has been captivated by the globalists, which really is the UN. But whatever this power is, Antiochus III, it's the USA asserting itself against the UN, right? Against spiritualism. And if it's going to be stirred up, so what's the stirred up? So Ptolemy the Fourth Philopater, we we don't know how we're going to. I mean, we just say he's the king of the south, right? So that here they put who he is, but we would just say this is. You know, so he's he's going to fight against Egypt, but he's going to be stirred up even to his Ptolemy, the Philopaters, that's the UN's fortress. Now, the UN's fortress, what is the fortress of the UN? If we're, if we're going to put this as... You guys would, need we to help. That, would we place that as wokeism? Okay. Well, wokeism is the philosophy. It's not necessarily the forest fortress, but we could say it's, I mean, if we tried to say that it, it's, it's, um, human rights, how, how was it put in the earlier one where it talked about, uh, um, because we didn't have fortress, but we had, um, Trying to remember a dominion. Um, it was their agreement. Where was the agreement? It must have been here. Um, You know the verse I'm talking about? Um, let me see it here. Yeah, here it is. Um, Yeah, they make an agreement. That Eleven six. Go, what's that? Eleven six. Um. Yeah, it's going to be eleven six. So they make an agreement. Now we looked at that making an agreement. Um, 
was actually had to do with human rights, right? That is to um, the word there make would be uh, uh, can mean lots of different things, but advance is one of them, and an agreement is rights. Right, so that this is about uh, these counterfeit human rights. Right, so that's we're going to say that's wokeism. So, um, but this fortress then must be um, this false human rights. So. How would we describe? I mean, we could just say it's wokeism, I guess. So maybe I'll just do it that way. I'll just do what you said. <laughs> but I, I want to understand that this is is wokeism is in in contrast to the American Constitution, right? To true human rights. That's kind of the point. Yeah. So this is wokeism, and we can call it maybe. Uh, Group rights, right? Do it this way. So, so wokeism is group rights, as opposed to individual rights, and that and that's sort of where the conflict is. Now we can see how. So this is one of the the sort of bizarre things about Parminder's group. Because they're talking about group rights as being the Sunday law, right? But really, the American Constitution never addresses group rights. It only addresses individual rights, the right of the individual. Right. And they try to say, well, you know, all of this, you know, all of this is about, you know, human rights, you know, and in human rights, they mean group rights. You know, we need to recognize that, you know, black people were oppressed. And so if you're white, you have white privilege, um, even though more white people are shot by cops um, than black people, black people are being shot by cops. And so that's racism even when there's no evidence of racism. And with the situation with, uh, can't think of his name, George Floyd, the guy, uh, you know, who ended up in prison. I mean, there's no evidence. Nobody brought any evidence of racist. He definitely hated drug addicts, right? And criminals. And he probably wasn't the nicest guy in the world. But there's no evidence that that, that, that was a racist um, crime. No, nobody ever brought any charges of racism. Anything that he ever did that was racist. The cop who killed George Floyd. So, but yet it was about racism, right? It was about race. So, so if you're going to look at what happens with the Sunday Law, isn't the Sunday Law about group rights and not individual rights? if you understand what I'm saying, from the side of Sunday? Yes. Right. So it's not it's not caring about individual rights at all. It's caring about group rights. What is best for the group? What does the majority decide to do? And if the majority decides to do something, you need to accept it. Who cares about your individual rights? Those don't matter, right? We see the same thing with vaccines, you know. Even if it was true, we'll just say it's true, that me not getting vaccinated puts other people at risk. That's just the risk other people have to take in order for individual rights to be protected. Right? Because individual rights, what I do with my own body, 
is an individual right. And nobody can say, well, you have to do this because other people might be at risk. They can stay away from me. You know, they don't have to hang around me if they want to. But the point is, individual rights have been trampled upon. And that will be the case in the Sunday law. So if we care about human rights at all, the only rights that, that should matter are the rights of the individual. If you protect individual rights, you don't need to worry about group rights. They're automatically protected in the sense that each individual is protected. If you're part of a group, it doesn't matter because you're also an individual. Right. So and, and it becomes difficult, of course, group rights, because which group rights matter and which group do you belong? And how do you decide, you know, who's which which rights trump other rights? But if you have the rights of the individual, only the rights of the individual matter. And this is something given us from God. Right. It's not something that uh, man can bestow. It's an inalienable right to be able to decide for yourself what you believe. Now, I also do believe that there are consequences for belief. I, I don't believe that, that individual rights means that we should have no consequences for our actions. Right? That is, I know when I keep Saturday as the Sabbath, it's going to affect my ability to get jobs. Right. I, I personally don't think that somebody has to hire me who who wants to hire somebody who's who can work on Sabbath and I can't decide not to hire me because I can't. I don't I don't think that that's an issue. If they want somebody to work on Sabbath, you know, they want them to work seven days a week. And I say, well, you know, I can only work six. I don't think my human rights need to be protected if. If they don't hire me. Right. So, so I understand there's consequences for every choice that we make. And so one of the things about uh, the American Constitution and individual rights is that um, that the individual is taking the responsibility to act in the way that he believes he needs to act. And that the state um, should not be taking away that person's individual rights. They should be protect, protected by the Constitution. It doesn't mean that, you know, that person, everything that they want, that they get, right? That's sort of more what you get with group rights. You understand what I'm saying? So, <clears throat> so I don't know how, I'm, I'm really going to think a lot about this over the weekend on how to approach what we're doing. And I, I've thought a lot about it already. You know, I've tried to understand this history at, at the best that I can. And I've tried to understand how the movement has looked at this. But I don't see that we can just, you know, once we start doing this detailed analysis, I don't think it fits in with Chawatu's interpretation of this. But I do think it applies to ours. But I think some of this we have to go. It, it is the future because I think the Battle of Rafi and Puniam are still in the future. But we can't make an application of exactly what's going to happen as this history is repeated. All we know is that there is going to be this conflict between what is called the king of the south and the king of the north. And the king of the south must be globalism, and the king of the north must be Republican USA. Right? And that in some way, Republican America is going to lose to wokeism in a worse way than we've seen already. I know as Christians, we'd like to see the world get better, right? I mean, maybe not as Christians, as human beings, right? We'd like to see the world get better. We don't like to see all the suffering and human rights being taken away. 
But I think things are going to get worse. Before they get better. And, and even when they so-called get better, it's going to be worse than the worst was. Right? Because when we have the Sunday law, when we have all of those events of Bible prophecy, that's going to be a response to this type of wokeism, which I think is going to be even something that we hadn't seen before. So I think we can expect our human rights to be trampled on both by the left and the right, by the globalists and by uh, the Christians, so-called, right? And so we're not going to see the world improve we shouldn't be looking for it to improve. We're going to see the world getting worse. And we have a message to give, right? And that message is something that we're still grappling with, trying to understand how do we take what we have learned and present it first to Seventh-day Adventists. And it has to be something that's going to stir Adventists that's going to wake them up to their responsibility. And uh, for those Adventists who, who accept this message, um, they're going to have to stand against the majority, right? So we're not going to see the majority of Seventh-day Adventists accepting this. And when you look at our small group and you think, well, what what role can we possibly play in end time events? Because we're not anyone that is important. We're not leaders in this movement even, right? We're just really nobodies. We're sort of the outcasts of the outcasts of the outcasts, if you want to look at it that way. And so, so God is going to take the weak things of the world to confound the wise. Right? So, so we're just doing what we can here. But, but I do think that we're going to have to decide on how we're going to take this battle of Rafi and Paneum. Are we going to just look at them as something in the future that we can't really place in a present truth application? Or are we going to um, make an application to what has happened in this movement? Okay. So... Anyways, things to consider. So again, um, we're going to have a study Friday night at uh, 7 p.m. I have a study Friday night Mountain Standard Time now because we changed from daylight time back to standard time in the fall. And uh, that study is um, going to continue looking at uh, what happened in 1888 and uh, how that message have been rejected and what that message means to us now. And then on Sabbath, we're not going to have the study in the morning at 7.30 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. We're going to stop the early morning Sabbath studies, and we're just going to have studies uh, from a Sabbath school from 10 to 11, and then from 11 to 12. And for people in East Africa, that's going to be from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. that they're going to have that study. Correct, Samuel? Is that how that works, if you're there? Maybe he's not listening at the moment. <clears throat> so so that, you know, that was done for people in Africa. I know um, it happens to be the time during which the Canadian-American groups have their studies. Um Yet, uh, that's, um, that's just the way it is. Okay. Any final comments before we close with prayer? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the time that we had here this morning. I know, Lord, there's much we do not understand, and we need your help. And guidance. I pray um, that you can continue to teach us. Sometimes we feel, Lord, as if 
uh, we don't understand anything. And, um, but yet you have showed us so much. So we ask for your continued help. Be with each person. May your angels watch over them and bring us together again to study your word um, according to thy will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.